you are about to enter the Shockwave Skull Sessions podcast. Coming soon to shockwaveskullsessions.com. And now your host, Bob Nalbandian. You got your uh, armor gear all set up, Martin Popoff? Absolutely. No no worries here. Because Monty Connor's <laughs> been grinding his axe all morning, dude. <laughs> For those that don't know, this is the return. The return of the Shockwave Skull Sessions. And uh, I was just chatting with Monty Connor here, and you said it's been about 10 years since we got the three of us to uh, do one of these discussions. Wow. Or should I say wow. brain bash. Well, we better not wait 10 years for the next one because Martin's <laughs> going to be in a wheelchair by then. <laughs> this is true. So, uh, but, so the beating I'm about to take. <laughs> so, so if you don't recognize the voices in the background, we have the old Shockwave Skull Sessions regular, Mr. Monty Connor, who was responsible for the Shockwave Skull Sessions podcast, which used to uh, be hosted by Roadrunner Records back in your old oh, Roadrunner wow. days many moons wow. ago. And, of course, Martin Popoff. Author yes. extraordinaire Martin Popoff was always a regular, and uh, I think uh, people enjoyed the uh, three of us the most because uh, they got pretty animated. They got. They're going to get even more animated this time. Oh, absolutely. Because we're talking about a subject that Martin and I vehemently ve- – what's the word? Ve- vehemently. vehemently. I- yeah, I didn't say it disagree on yeah. whereas uh you know i always uh, love the classics by the band and usually hate the uh recent records they put out and martin often loves the recent records and thinks they're better than the classics so yeah yes, this is often, gonna be, sometimes, this is gonna be bloody. sometimes not but you know i mean i i think we we got to start with sort of a uh a philosophical thing here because i i really like when we talked about we had the debate about why is it sensible or reasonable or logical that bands in their 20s are better than they do are when they get older? Because if you think of things like visual arts, like painting, you know, it, it's essentially considered that the greatest, you know, uh, artists, the legends are even better when they're 60, 70, 80 years old, 80 years old. So it's, it's you know, that's not going to happen in rock and roll, but I'm wondering why. And I want to ask both of you guys, because this, this is a question that's just burning me up. It's like, why does it make sense that bands would make their greatest music in their 20s? Well, it makes total sense to me because there's something about being young and in touch with what's happening and having an axe to grind you know, just basically having issues in your life, having drama, having things that upset you. What happens is when you become old, older, you basically become complacent and you just, you're more accepting of things. You just don't have that inner desire to just fucking rage and scream. And, you know, that kind of stuff is where the magic is born. You know, like it's just, it's impossible for someone who's in their fifties to write the kind of music with the same kind of passion that they're going to have in their 20s, with having things to say, with wanting to rebel. Um, And also, you know, when you're younger, you just have more ideas. You have riffs in your head and all kinds of creativity that just seems to dry up as you get older. Um, You know, like the perfect example I always give is you look at someone like Paul McCartney, right? This guy has written, you know, arguably 50 or 60 songs that are, ingrained in our head that, you know, like life-changing songs that will be with the world for as long as the world exists, right? And now, how old is Paul McCartney now? 75-ish. Okay, if you took Paul McCartney's entire extended family and lined them up against the wall and put a machine gun in front of them and told him his entire family was going to be mowed down unless, you know, unless he wrote another Let It Be, you know what happened? The fucking family would die. Like, you just can't do it. This is a guy, like the most talented songwriter, potentially in the history of the world, couldn't come up with one of those songs in his 70s. He just can't do it. And, you know, and that's, there's a billion examples like that. That's just one of many. Okay. So, Bob, proof in the pudding. Shut in. Well, my take, I mean, you know, yeah, you have to separate it. There, There is maturity. People say, you know, you mature as you get older. Some people mature, some people get jaded. And I think after, you know, 20, 30 years of recording, you could hear that the artists kind of get jaded. And of course, the industry changes, you know, uh, especially now with, you know, CDs, new recordings not being nearly as important. Uh, I think that's had a lot of effect where bands just want to put out a record just so they could tour. They know it's not going to be a big moneymaker, so they don't put the time and effort into it. But 
nonetheless, I think that, that you know, something you and I talked about, uh, uh, Martin, about, you know, the, the movie I just did, Band vs. Brand. When does, you know, the band become a brand where the brand is more important than the actual, you know, members of the band and the writing process and everything? It's, it, the brand will sell on its own, you know? And yeah. I think that's... Where it's become with a lot of bands, it's just, you know, people see that brand, whether it's the Rolling Stones or Zeppelin or whatever, and they just are geared to it. You know, it's there. there is a difference between being mature and being hungry and aggressive and really having that desire to make it. And uh, I always think that and that friction where you're kind of struggling, that brings out the best in artists, whether it be musicians, you know, painters, athletes, whatever. It's, it's so apparent to me when going back to these bands and hearing their back catalog as compared to their newer records. In yeah, most, I mean, yeah. that's a good point. And, and Monty made a lot of great points there. And I'm even going to add to that and say, and, and this is a little bit what you're saying, Bob, the idea of being hungry and eager and there's also something about in your 20s where you think you got the world by the balls you think you know everything Mm. and that enthusiasm of thinking you know everything transfers over to your audience i think um so there's there's definitely this um this hunger to put across your messages you think you have all the messages i'm just not sure in every case you do i mean i i i think you're you're right there's that great balance between maturity and and being not so not so mature or you really didn't have all the answers in your 20s and you know you want to start with the first band i mean we wanted to sort of transition i know bobby had a plan that we were going to talk about a few different bands and the first one we were going to talk about is deep purple which is a very contentious one in all of this because they're one of the few bands that actually has gone out in interviews and and plumped for this idea of i i'm i'm writing now as a 50 as a 60 year old talking about different things than I would in my 20s. You know, things I might have talked about back then are not so becoming to me now. And I think you know, we, we could almost break this up by lyrics versus music a little bit, but I think um, you know, my argument that that possibly a larger quantity of bands than either, you know, you, Bob, or Monty would argue are better now, I would probably have a few more of those and Deep Purple is one of those because I think I think lyrically They've just always gotten better. I mean, they are just wiser old men, and they're doing a better job at that. And you know, here's where we get in a bit of a bit of a thing. You know, I, I know Monty. Another thing is this: you know, you got to disqualify the fact that you're sick of something you've heard way too many times. You are absolutely right about that. But I also think. You know, Deep Purple is a band that has, I love the Steve Morse years, and I think they have settled into this cool thing where they are very experimental with what they're doing musically. They're they're heavy still, and I think lyrically they're pretty good. So I really actually think Deep Purple is a good example of one of these bands that is mature, not just like old and doddering. Forget about Ian Gill and live singing, but I'm talking about the records. I'm done. Wow. (laughs) I'll give you the fact that, yeah, look, Deep Purple is having a bit of a uh, good period. The last couple of records, I think ever since they teamed up with Bob Ezrin, I think for the last two records, they've been surprisingly solid given the age of the band. But if you're going to tell me that anything they've done with Morse or anything in the last 20 years holds a candle to the in rock through come taste the band glory years of the band, then you're just batshit crazy. Like There's just no way any of that shit holds a flame to the classic years. So okay, the funny thing I say. I, I disagree. Okay, the, the, the one point I'll make about why I would almost say that, because I love Perpendicular, the fans love Perpendicular, I love Abandon, all of those. The one thing I would say that, that, that puts a really weird wrinkle in the Deep Purple one is that most of those albums that are the classic albums have two or three songs that I'm definitely not crazy about at all. And into the CD era, if they stick 12 or 13 songs on an album, I'm liking nine of them. So um, I, I almost think mathematically I'm, I'm happier with something like Abandoned and great productions and all that stuff. And they're heavy and, like I say, great lyrics, etc. But, you know, you, you, you threw in Come Taste the Band. In there is also Stormbringer. In there is also Who Do We Think We Are. Fireball is, is a little uneven. So it's pretty easy to put Abandoned over one or two of those. Wow. It's, it's almost like Martin's almost that- able to justify this. 
Not quite, but Dude, you're pretty good, Mark. I, I don't even know how to. I don't even know how to respond. This is like <laughs> trying to compare Abandoned to In Rock or Fireball or any of the classic records. It's basically like trying to argue with someone that says the sky is green when you know the sky is blue. I don't even know like and where Mark to come back. Mark knows that. It's just, it's I just think a, you know it's just that, a non-fact. Okay, like, Bob. I, how about you? Uh, you you uh, you know chime in on Purple, and then we'll move on to the next band. Okay. Well, you know what it really boils down to, I think, with Purple are many bands from the '70s, and I. I'm sure you've interviewed a lot of these bands, Martin. You talk about them in the 70s, whether it's, you know, Thin Lizzy, Nazareth, whatever. These bands, Queen, they were able to do what they wanted. They signed with a label. The label kind of gave them free reign. You know, if they want to do a a 20-minute song like Yes or, you know, Jethro Tull doing a passion play with one out, they had so much freedom to do what they wanted. And that's why I think you got to break it down in the decades. The 70s bands, it was that era where the bands had so much more control of their music. Once the 80s came around, and even you could maybe go up to the late 70s when FM Station became big, but really when the 80s came in with MTV and everything, it came so much more corporate, where the record labels had so much more control. The producers, they would get producers. They would get songwriters. They would get all sorts of different uh, people in the in the business influencing the artists on you have to do this. Money became such a control, and that really affected the music. And still up to today, it's still affected by the corporate you know, entities, whether it be, you know, you have to get this movie on a film soundtrack. You have to get this movie on this or that. So I think that plays, plays a big role, especially in 70s bands like Deep Purple, Sabbath, Zeppelin, you name it. These bands were able to do what they wanted, and they sold – huge numbers doing what they wanted and that's that i think is the key when you listen to these records i mean and and again martin you are batshit crazy if you can't if you can't go back and hear the vibe of in rock i mean i was just listening to that to, uh earlier this morning i mean the the beginning of hard loving man that you know the riff comes in i mean there deep purple hasn't written anything that cool in the last 30 years and to me, Blackmore was such a huge part of Purple, obviously. I love Steve Morris, and I do like the new albums. I think they've matured. And what you say lyrically, Ian Gillen is a brilliant lyricist, and I think he needs to balance that, realizing that he can't sing like he used to sing. So, And, and Ian's a very intelligent guy, so he uses different you know, metaphors, different lyrics, and different stuff. I mean, he, he's a very clever, witty guy. And those show. I mean, they're good records, but you cannot compare the latter records to the early records. There's just really no comparison. Yeah, in my eyes. and and let's but let's also give them credit. Like you know, given Deep Purple's age, the fact that they're still doing it, that you know, like they are. These Esmond records are really strong records, judged by you know a bunch of grandpas making rock records. Mm. Uh, I'll give them that. Solid records. They do an admirable job. But like I said, it's a pimple on the ass of the band in their prime. You just can't. I mean, if In Rock is a 10, then Abandon isn't even a 1. It's like half a point. I mean, that's the gap right there. You just can't. It's like two different planets you're trying to combine. One is a young, hungry band. There's no expectations on what they do. They have ideas. They're mad at the world. They want to, you know, make their place in the world. And then you have these guys that are, set, you know, in their 70s that are just insecure, wondering if what they're doing is good or not, like just happy to even have another chance. It's just a totally different mindset. You know, there's something that comes with getting older. Age, getting older just breeds insecurity. That's why you so. get all these older artists, you know, whether it's ACDC or ZZ Top or Deep Purple. You notice a lot of these fans are making records every 10 years because yeah. it takes them that long to find the inspiration, and they're just procrastinating. And, you know, instead of, like, a band living together, you know, in a room – like Aerosmith did back in the old days, you get these guys, you know, they have their grandkids and their wives, and they have to schedule the creativity. They have to find time to, like, get together and do it, and it takes them 10 years to do it. And you just can't compare that to, like, you know, a young band like Aerosmith, and they're 18 years old living in a, an apartment in Boston, like, ready to take on the fucking world. I mean, there's no comparison. You, it, apples and oranges. I, I, you know, I wouldn't use the word insecure. I, I think it's more laziness, and they get comfort. They're, they're no, in the comfort it's security zone. too. It's a little me, bit, but I think like, a lot of these bands don't care. It's not that I think they just get the time to get together. Like you say, they all have different schedules. They all have families. All right, let's get together. Let's write a record. This is kind of a lazy. You know, they get too much in their comfort zone where they're not hungry anymore. Yeah, like oh, Bob, look at the band Aerosmith. Like you read interviews with Aerosmith. Talk about a band that's lost and insecure. 
It's like these guys, if you read the interviews, like these guys, they forgot how to be Aerosmith. They, yeah. don't, they, they like need help to get in a room together and feel inspired and know what to do, what to write, what direction to take. It's pitiful. Yeah, well, if we go you know? to Aerosmith, uh, I, mean, I, I totally agree. I think Steven Tyler's insecure because he always wants to be liked by the youth. So he has that insecurity of, of becoming irrelevant. Where I think the other guys, uh, uh, some of the other guys, uh, just want to play Aerosmith. They like, you know, they like the old school Aerosmith. But I think with someone like Steven Tyler, they're scared of being being irrelevant in this day and age. So they always try to, you know, lean toward whatever they feel is hip to the modern. Right, that's where it goes modern. wrong. That instead of being Aerosmith, Aerosmith is a great example want, of that. They're I don't trying think, to be something they're not. I don't think Deep Purple fits that example because there's really nothing on the latter Deep Purple albums that you could say is hip to the millennial generation. I think they're just kind of doing what is, uh, what well, you know, it's more of a lazy, la- it's the fact of, like I say, it's, it's a mat- I think this is what they think they should be doing at their age. They know they can't hit the notes. They know they're not going to be able to have the energy or the power, or the hunger, or the drive that they did back in the day. So they're kind of stuck in this comfort zone. They're all brilliant musicians, uh, and they know they could, uh, you know, it's, it's kind of like that whole spinal tap thing, where they do, you know, let's just do uh, freeform jazz. <laughs> you know, it's just like, let's just do whatever. It's- I don't know, man. I, I think Purple, I, I'm going to have to disagree on both the insecure and the lazy. I think Purple is an example of a bunch of guys who go in there excited saying, we have 50 years of knowledge how to do this. Let's write some amazing music. And I think they do it almost every time. Now, I, let me chime in on Aerosmith because we've subtly, I, I suppose, moved on to the second band. I totally agree with you on Aerosmith. Monty, you make a great point when you say they forgot how to be Aerosmith. Every time I've ever interviewed Aerosmith for the last few albums, they keep saying, oh, we wanted to go in there and make an, make an old school album, but somehow yeah, they never do. it takes <laughs> over and it just goes on and on and on and then the schedules and then and then it just gets loaded up with tracks and then Steven wants to add another ballad and then they want to do a country yeah. song on here. And and absolutely, I mean, that that is a band that just comically keeps saying we, we want to go do what we used to do. Aerosmith has another problem that I think Foghat has a bit of a problem with too which is um and ufo actually phil mogg not so much Vinny, but definitely phil they're polluted by the blues the blues screws them up i mean i don't want to hear aerosmith blues i don't want to hear honking on bobo i don't want to hear the blues songs on ufo albums i don't want to hear foghat doing blues covers i want to hear foghat redoing you know the style of night shift and stone blue and fool for the city and stuff so i want to hear that i want to hear that you know transformed into heavy metal stuff yeah, but, so all, all, but all Martin, you, just, Martin, you just tapped into something totally brilliant with these bands doing blues covers. Think about it. Look at the Stones right now. The last record was blues covers. Yeah. Maybe these bands like wanting to do blues songs is them attempting to like tap back into that fucking tap into their youth about what excited them. I don't think it's any surprise that these bands are doing that. They're trying to recapture something and, and the blues is what they remember being excited about when they were fifteen. Absolutely. Yeah. I I would prefer hearing Honkin' on Bobo any day than hearing oh, Angel or any of these fucking Aerosmith but, sappy ballads. But look at music from another dimension, right? I mean, oh. like Martin said, all the intentions were pure, but then they go in there. And I think even, you know, a master like Jack Douglas was involved in that record. But then they go in there, and instead of writing eight songs, it becomes, oh, well, the CD can hold 70 minutes, so you start filling it with all this shit. And then they can't let go of the fact that they want to, you know, they're thinking about their, you know, radio singles and it. It, it, it just starts getting in their head again, and you get in the end, you get the same watered-down bullsh- radio bullshit with co-writes, what, you know, getting away from what they started to make. But if you remember my music from another dimension, I don't remember the name of the song, but there was that one song on that it sounded like a modern take of Rats in the Cellar. You know, like, give us a whole record of that. <laughs> Not all the bullshit. But the production was so bad, it has what I used to call with Bon Jovi, car sick production, production that makes you car sick. I mean, essentially, that started with um, Get a Grip. Um, and, and where you can't even really work out what the guitars are because Joe Joe is always searching for a, for a strange sound. He likes strange for the sake of strange. So he's always looking for these weird textures and stuff. So even that heavy one, nothing on that album even sounded heavy. And then to bring up another one, there's one song they had on there that Jack Douglas, somehow they corralled it and said, you know, they made it sound like rocks. They made it sound like, like, uh, like a last child, essentially. But the song wasn't very good. So it was almost like we're trying to second guess ourselves to do this. You know, one one more point that that 
kind of leans again to the um, to the to the early stuff that we haven't really mentioned here at all is there's also extra magic in being there first and blazing a trail. Deep Purple's blazing a trail with those old albums. Aerosmith's blazing a trail with those old albums. So you know that that works against you in old age too because you're now doing something even if you're doing something that's similar to what you used to do. Well, it's just been done a million times by by you yourself plus everybody who's been copying you all these years. So that obviously, I mean, there, there's something to be said for in rock simply because it's completely pioneering. I mean, it's absolutely the heaviest album, uh, the first super heavy album. It's 1970. It's competing against the first Sabbath and the second Sabbath and in rock and the first year I heap. And that's all there is. And in rock's the best one of all, all, all four of those albums. But also, but think about when the bands are young. Like they're, you know, when Deep Purple are making their first few records, there's no, there's no pressure, there's no expectation. You know, like meanwhile, these guys are in their 70s, and there's there's an expectation of how many records they need to sell. You know, the bills that they need to pay. Uh, they need to write something that fits their past, that but also shows their progression. All this, you know, also shows that they're not just phoning it in. You know, that they're trying to move forward as a band, which is important. All these old guys. So there's all these different things convoluting the vision, whereas when they're young, you know, the vi- they don't have any of this stuff. It, their minds are just free, and they can make the magic without having all the expectation of what they think they need to be doing, you know, and they lose the plot. That's why you get a band like Aerosmith, like they have no idea what to do. They put these guys in a room together, they don't know what to do. And some of them, you know, people like Joe Perry, and like some of these people are blatant in these interviews saying that, and it's just fucking sad, you know? I mean, maybe a band like Aerosmith needs a guy like Rick Rubin, you know. I mean, one thing that Rick Rubin specializes in, he seems to be able to get a band in a room together and make them, like, remember who they were and attempt to get them back in that spirit like he did with Sabbath. I don't um, think that works, no. You know, and I'm not, not that I think 13 is a great record by any means, but, like, at least he's getting them to try and be Sabbath again and forget all the bullshit. And, and like, God, a band like Aerosmith needs, needs Rick Rubin or anybody who can – Kind of teach him how to be Aerosmith again. I think we could all agree on Aerosmith, right? How about how about you, Bob? Where are you on on Aerosmith? Well, as far as Aerosmith, I I, I see what you're saying, but I think Rick Rubin was kind of the the. I mean, being an old school guy and loving the old Aerosmith, I think he was the kind of the the demon alcohol in that band. He when he did the uh, whole the walk this way, that gave him a real taste of success, MTV success. And from then on, I think that just was the only thing that was lodged into Steven Tyler's mind. And, you know, which is fine. I mean, Steven Tyler's a visual guy. He's got great personality. He's, you know, he was made for that MTV era. But, you know, you look at all the albums that followed, it just got worse and worse and worse and worse. And I think they just got so caught up in the whole commercialism and the fame of MTV and and all that other stuff that it just ruined them. But, you know, I want to go back to, uh, as, as we move on, Monty made a great choice when he mentioned about progression and that's something that that's interesting because you don't want i mean the thing that i think we're, we're, we're all aware of is you don't want the bands to repeat themselves you know to make the same record from the 70s and keep they do have to progress and when you come to a band like deep purple i think they did it brilliantly if you look at the mark one mark two mark three how they went from the era with rod evans and nick simper to uh you know, when Ian Gillen came in and that, you know, as, as we all will agree, that was probably the most important era, the Mark II era of, of, of Deep Purple. But then, you know, they got a Coverdale in and a Glenn Hughes and it changed into a little bit more of a funky sound. And David was such a different vocalist than Ian. And they changed in a very cool way. I mean, they progressed. And that is cool. I mean, you don't want the band to keep you can't keep doing who do we think we are which i think was one of their weakest albums to be honest and i think that's something we, we all we all look at you want the band to progress but you want them to progress on their own terms and i think what kills so much bands is the outside influences whether it be from producers whether it be from record label from mtv from whatever and the bands that progress on their own merit i think are the ones that have, have, have stayed true and, and, and stood the test of time I mean, Aerosmith is an interesting example of a band that just never really progressed. I mean, they they more or less perfected their sound and then they just did kind of, uh, you know, 
acceptable, successful iterations of that. I mean, I think Pump's a pretty good album. I like uh, I like Rock in a Hard Place. Um, I, I like uh, Night in the Ruts. But essentially, and even even uh, the last two records are essentially they're they're not that different in the stylistic melange of the early stuff. They're just way worse versions of it and second guess versions. And and here is definitely a, a big example of the insecurity. Not so much the laziness. They're, I, I think they're all trying hard, um, but that, this is an insecurity one. And the one band that I think of that is so much like Aerosmith in this department, like forgot what they were doing, had no idea how to write anymore, is Scorpions. Scorpions has that big problem. They could, they could try be heavy, but even when they try be heavy, there's just something missing there. It's kind of like... It, it's more it's more savage amusement and uh, and love it for sting than it is blackout or god forbid uli john roth era right i mean it's just there's just something or, or like it's more crazy world it's kind of it, it, it's just this sawed off like you you guys kind of have completely forgot who who you are and i i think aerosmith and scorpions are, are very very similar in that respect oh thank god i i, I was worried that you were going to say <laughs> Eye for an Eye was the best Scorpions album of all time. Yeah. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Dude, well, yeah, since we're on the brutal. topic of Scorpions, uh, I'll just chime in real quick. I think, again, I think that really goes from, from the uh, era of the band. And they were a band up until the mid-'80s that were really able to progress in, in a very uh, a smart way with the times. I mean, the 70s, uh, I think, are the most brilliant Scorpio albums. I mean, In Trance, even Fright of the Rainbow, Take It By Force, Uli Roth. What a phenomenal guitar player. Completely original band. Has, you know, some Hendrix influence thrown in with this German kraut rock metal and just this craziness. Uh, very different from any... Uh, they sounded very German, you know, when you listen to them. And it was, like, totally different from the British bands and the American bands. And it was just something so unique and i think when they got into love drive which is actually one of my favorite scorpions albums you know again they progressed they had you know much more um you could say marketable songs but you know shanker comes in whole different guitar approach different writing approach great tunes heavy songs catchy tunes and uh, even the, the the Matthias Jabs era after Animal Magnetism up and up until maybe Savage Amusement, I think they progressed in a very cool way. Where it comes from, you know, from the seventies, they upgraded to the eighties. They got some great radio play. Always a phenomenal live. So, show. what do you think their problem is now? Well, they just got. I, I think they're old and jaded, and they're just repeating themselves. And you could compare them with with a band like ACDC. They know the formula that works. I think they've, they've gone through this era, and they realize, okay, this is kind of the formula that works best for us. And again, as we mentioned, they've tried some experimentation, which failed miserably when they did Man, I for an eye, yeah. and and did, when they tried to fit. Yeah, but- Humanity won. Yeah, humanity won. So they go back and they realize, okay, that didn't work for us. What worked best for us? This is what made us the most money. This is what gave us the most popularity. But, Bob, some of these bands you're mentioning, like you're comparing 70s Scorpions to 80s Scorpions or 70s Aerosmith to 80s Aerosmith. Keep in mind that these bands changed. They became more commercial. They grew, whatever. You know, you're talking about Love Drive and, like, that era of Scorpions. Keep in mind, these bands are in their 30s at that stage, right? True. So, you know, they're past their 20s. They're still making the magic in their 30s. But try, you know, take guys in their 40s and up and, you know, try and compare what they're doing to the shit they did when they were young. Like, across the board, there's not a single one of those bands that, let's say, 50 and up that are making records that touch the music they made in their 20s. You can't name a single band that is competing. You're listening to the right? wrong choir. I it's agree. Deep- Exactly. No, Deep Purple's not. Deep Purple's not. I'm, I mean, I will give them credit. They're making good records. Deep Purple's doing as great as anybody their age can do. But you can't compare that shit to their youth. You just can't. You know, and I'm not trying to trash Deep Purple here. I mean, I have a tremendous amount of respect for those guys. I love the band. Like I said, they're doing it as just about as well as you can do it, given their age. But, uh, again, you can't compare that stuff to their, you know, the stuff they made in the 70s or even... In the 80s with Perfect Strangers, like when they came back and reformed for Perfect Strangers, you know, what were they, like 35, 36? Like you could still do it then. They couldn't make a Perfect Strangers now. What about Cheap Trick? <laughs> uh, I haven't really followed Cheap Trick too much, but um, 
you know, everybody keeps saying, oh, the new Cheap Trick is like the best thing in years. It's a return to form. I, every time I hear it, it doesn't, I don't get that impression. I don't think any of that yeah. stuff compares to their classic records in the 70s. That's why we do Motorhead? How about we do Motorhead? That's what I think is, is a, another good example. But you guys go ahead first. Well, that's another Well, wait, the great thing about Motorhead, by the way, here's another thing we can say about older musicians is that they're not content to be nostalgia acts. Like, they don't want to go out on the road and play their greatest hits. You know, they want to, you know, a guy like Lemmy, you have to give the guy an amazing amount of credit that he never wanted Motorhead to be a nostalgia act. This was a guy right up until the end who put out a new record every two years like Clockwork, yeah. went out and toured for it, played some of these new songs live, and, you know, needed to prove to himself in the world that he could still do it, that he was relevant, that he was making new music, he wasn't resting on his name and his past. And you got to give the guy incredible, you know, props for that. And I like a lot of those later Motorhead records. There's a few good songs on each one. But again, you know, Martin and I have had this debate in the past. I forgot when it was where Martin said he thought the last five Motorhead records were better than the, you know, uh, overkill through Iron Fist era, like that run of five records, which, again, is just batshit crazy. I mean, that's like just insanity. And that's not saying that the new records aren't good. But you can't compare Kiss of Death or motorizer. I mean, they just don't hold the fucking candle. Ace of Spades and Overkill. I mean, you're you're deluded if you think they do. And okay, so here, here and that's not trashing those records. I'm not trying to trash the new Motorhead records. Okay, I'm just here's saying kind of reality. Is, just to break it down a little bit. I love the playing. I love the riffs. The ferocity of the production. I think. And here's here's a weird way that I kind of justify this. This gets into really into the weeds of this comparing old and new. And and we've had this this conversation before. But if you parachuted any of those songs onto those old records, they would kill your favorite songs on those records. No way. Ace of Spades and Overkill are boring compared to. Dude, no way. That's no, the, crazy. the song. I mean the songs crazy. compared to. The, the OTT songs on the newer albums. So that's one thing. The other thing is, like, the productions, like, don't hold a candle. Those those records are unlistenable compared to the newer productions. And I think lyrically, Lemmy is is another one of those rare Ian Gillen slash Roger Glover doing his crosswords kind of guys who just got wiser and wiser and wiser over the years and wrote better and better lyrics. He was always a good lyricist anyways. But, you know, I, I don't see any reason... To to um to say Fast Eddie Clark was more entertaining to listen to than Phil Campbell, or or uh, or Filthy Animal was more entertaining or a better drummer than Mickey D. So when I break it down and I look at all these different pieces of it, I, I'm perfectly happy with the new stuff over the old stuff. You know, Lemmy it was that's another thing. Lemmy was a guy who would really get mad if you said the old stuff was classics in front of him, right? He'd say that that old stuff is ropey. That's the that's the term he would use. And he's absolutely right in a way. He, he's essentially saying, hey, listen, listen closely. I got and I and my band got better and better and better all the time. The only Wait, time Fred sucked was Martin. when they were on Sony and they had that corporate influence and outside songwriters and novelty songs and Cat Scratch Fever. Other than that, from Bastards On, they were as lethal a band as they were in the art well, no. Hey, we, Hey, I was watching a new episode this Sunday of the TV show Billions. Have you heard of it? You I know, heard that and, and stuff about yeah. East of yes. Okay, right. And the show starts off with the 2009 re-record of Ace of Spades that was done for, I guess, some, you know, some kind of Metallica video game or yeah. something. And, and it's, you know, Mickey D was an incredible drummer, right? Yeah. And, you know, you hear the new version of Ace of Spades, and it just fucking just doesn't hold a candle to the old one. Not that Mickey D is not an incredible drummer, but he just doesn't capture the vibe that they had with Filthy Animal Taylor. I mean, listen to Lemmy on it, dude. You, and so you talk about, like, old production being shitty. Dude, the fucking old version of Ace of Spades on the album destroys this re-record in every way possible. So, dude, I'm not buying it. Like, if I, I mean, any of us on the phone right now could name every single song on Overkill, every single song on Ace of Spades. We could name every song on Iron Fist. I mean, if I put a gun to Bob's head right now, he couldn't name three songs off Kiss of Death. Martin, yeah, I mean, you could name this. I mean, these are forgettable stuff. fucking records. Yeah, part of this is compared also compared to the classics. It's almost the reverse thing that you're doing right now because, you know, 
when, when you get mad at me for saying I, I don't rate so Paranoid, Black Sabbath Paranoid as an album highly because I'm sick of it, I mean, there's some there's some credence to that. But when you say the new version of Ace of Space doesn't hold a candle to the old one, is because you, in your job even, let alone just being a, a listener for pleasure, have heard those sounds and those kinds of drummers a thousand times in the last five years. So you're sick to death of the new synthetic version of these things. And and you're right. I mean, that there is a magic. And again, the other great thing about Motorhead in the old days is they were absolutely blazing a trail. I, I've said many times Overkill and Bomber are two, are probably the two heaviest albums of the entire 70s. You know, that that's saying something. That's it's pretty incredible that they could do that. And all those ingredients. And it's magic and all that. But again, also, this whole idea about Lemmy calling it ropey, you know, when we, when we say the new stuff doesn't hold a candle and you go super extreme on it. I mean, you're not even giving me that, that some of this stuff can even be close. You're saying miles away and all this stuff. Part of, yeah, but no, but there are good songs. Every one of those later day records has some great songs. I mean, you could make an incredible best of record, uh, you know, like two songs each from the last seven or eight motorhead records and make a best of later day motorhead years. I'm, I'm and a record you, like that, yes, it could yeah. it could stand up to the old record. I'm Absolutely. You, if, if you took over Kill and put it on and went song by song, you would say, "Holy crap! There five of these are not very good songs." No, so, I wouldn't say that. I would record, not say that. They they could be very <laughs> sim- simple and rudimental. You know, it, you, you you almost go back sometimes to these records and you're surprised at how simple these songs are. And yeah, you know, that might lead to our next band, Saxon, because there's a there's a funny thing that goes on with that band too, right? A whole different story, right? But <laughs> You want to go no, I, don't know. I mean, I love all that old Motorhead stuff. I agree, and I, w- I would not say the new albums are better uh, just just as magical, artistic, creative statements. But I'm just saying you could break them down, and you could come up for, for a whole bunch of reasons why there's something just, just having 50 years, uh, again, just having 50 years of experience. You know, when a painter says, when someone walks up to a painter who's who's 70 years old and said, how long did that take you? The, the answer they want to hear or the real answer is four hours. But the painter says to them, it took me my whole life. And that's why I could do it in four hours. So that so some of that you have to apply to the idea of a motorhead and a deep purple and, and say, you know, they're, they're creative. They're, even if they can bang this stuff out, um, it's pretty incredible. And if you start no. beating this stuff, it's, it's pretty good. But wait, so you give a good example. It is true that painters and, and authors, you know, in certain professions, the experience, you know, they age like fine wine. But I'm telling you, it doesn't work in music. It just does not. For whatever reason, you can't equate you know, the Lemmy making Overkill with the Lemmy making, uh, you know, The World is, or Aftershock, or The World is Yours, whatever those records are, you can't compare that to, like, an author or uh, a painter painting in his later years where the age and experience, it, you know, where where 70-year-old painter is on top of their game, or 70-year-old author is on top of their game. It does not work that way in music, period. It just agree. doesn't. I agree. Fact. Agree. Let, let me add some before we move on. Do, do you want to move on to Saxon or should we do Judas Priest? I don't know if uh, Monty's so familiar with the latter Saxon. I'm well, well not... see, Judas Priest, Judas Priest is an amazing example to go to because this is a band who are in their twilight years who made an amazing fucking record. I mean, I have nothing bad to say about Painkiller. I would put Painkiller up against uh, – I'm sorry, not Painkiller uh, – uh, firepower. firepower yeah. I put Firepower right up there with, like, you know, the band's classics. I mean, that is a complete anomaly of a band that proves that it can still be done. I mean, Judas Priest did it. Well, that, record's a, that record's phenomenal. The question I think a lot of people have about Firepower, <laughs> is that really truly Judas Priest, or is it the brand Judas Priest? Cause I totally know, agree. That's Judas Priest to me. It's that good. I mean, to, to me, to me, that's that is the same thing as all the latest Saxon and Accept albums. It's that paint of not paint by numbers. This is what people expect. Priest never grew as lyricist, that's for sure, and that annoys me. I, I, think, I think Firepower is a, a fine record, but I mean, it is it is self aware and paint by numbers and a little bit of insecurity there. But but and it's you know I I'm surprised you're not saying it's too desktop metal for me. It's too synthetic. I mean, the things you don't like about modern day motorhead you know be, having all these great professional sounds that you've heard a thousand times is 10 times worse in modern priest i mean the, i mean Dude, those I, i'm not talking crazy. i'm not talking about the, the production of firepower i'm just to me firepower just sounds like 
vintage vital Judas Priest. It's great fucking songs. I'm not even talking about the production of the Sonics. I'm talking about the passion. Uh, I'm talking about the songwriting. And the I'm, finding, I'm finding I'm still finding but these latest albums. I mean, even Pain Painkiller to me is essentially uh, people make the exact same arguments for Painkiller than they'll make for Firepower, even though they're separated by whatever it is, 25 years. I mean, to me, Priest is a funny one because I love the old Priest so much. To me, that run of albums from 76 to 79 is literally the greatest run of rock and roll albums. Forget about in heavy metal. It's probably even better than the run of Queen albums to me. Um, so to me, Priest is so sacrosanct that they're never going to live up to it for me. So I, I have, I, I'm just always going to have these mixed feelings about Priest. Um, so I don't know. I, I'm, not, I'm not really buying. I like Firepower, but I'm not really buying that it's really doing anything more special over Sabbath 13 or the last, you know, the Mark Ternillo Accept albums or the or the Saxon albums, which are all highly, highly professional, awesome, look how good we are albums, but they're still a little paint by numbers. Let me chime in here and well, uh, make a comment on what you said before about Motorhead, which is, you know, when you say Lemmy says, you know, oh, about the new album, every artist is going to say that. You talk to any artist, course. they're going to say their last record is their best. So that Really, I mean, I love Lemmy and and whatnot, but any artist is going to tell you their last album they did, no matter how shitty it might be. I'm sure Scorpions on their press was saying Eye for the Eye is the greatest Scorpions album they ever recorded. So, you know, that doesn't really show any merit. Yeah, they're all, they're all going to say that. Absolutely, including I mean, Lemmy. And by the way, I hope I, you know, didn't come across as negative. I have tremendous respect for Motorhead. Tremendous respect for every record they made right up until the end. I buy those records. I think there's magic on, you know, in certain parts of those records. I'm only being negative, Martin, when you're trying to basically put that stuff up against the heyday. Which yeah, is and just, I agree with you 100%, Monty. And yeah. I think most, I'd say 90% of the Motorhead fans agree. I mean, the classic lineup was Lemmy, Eddie, and Filthy Animal. They had magic together. And again, the, I'm not talking musicianship. Yeah, sure. You could argue Mickey D is a far better drummer than Filthy. He does not fit the oh, Motorhead awesome, style. But Filthy was better for Motorhead. Way better for Motorhead. Fast Eddie yeah, was way but, better but, for But Motorhead. Mickey as the drummer destroys Filthy Animal. I mean, there's no comparison. Absolutely, you know? man. That was the magic of Motorhead. It had that loose, heavy, raw feel, you know, and... Back then, the bands, again, they had that drive. They had that hunger. You know, whether it be the drugs or whatever they were on there, they were motivated. They had that I don't give a fuck attitude. I'm going to take over the world. And any of these modern albums we're talking about, you don't hear that anymore. These bands get comfortable. Yeah. They get in their comfort zone. They own a house. They own this. They got nothing they have to strive for. And I think that is the biggest thing when you compare these earlier releases to the latter releases. And you can't deny that, Martin. You know, a funny thing I, I noticed the other day, I was reading a, an old Q magazine, and uh, Paul Weller, I love the jam. I worship the jam. But basically, when he was doing those first couple of albums, the guy was like 18, 19 years old. And I almost felt like like I'd been defrauded in a way, right? It's like, it's like, I, I, here I am thinking this guy's like the reincarnation of Ray Davies and is, and is just like this wise old sage and he's writing all this great English stuff about all these, these you know people going to their jobs and getting fired and all this. And the guy's 19 years old, right? <laughs> so it's, it's funny. Uh, you go back then and, and these, guys, these guys were older than us then, but it's, but it's as you move on in years, I also have this problem now. Where, where I can't listen to a lot of 20-year-old people telling me, you know, what life's all about, right? So it's, it's, it's a funny thing. I, I don't know. It, I, I guess what I'm getting at is it's, it's, pretty, it's pretty bizarre for us to think these guys were geniuses when they were 23 years old. But, you know, in, in a lot of ways they are. I'm buying a lot of these arguments, and of course I, I almost, you know, two-thirds of the time I am leaning the same direction as you guys. So what's your next band, Bob? Go ahead. You guys go ahead. Oh, were you guys finished on Priest, or did you want to touch a little bit more? Uh, well, no. I mean, I pretty much said all I had to say. I thought Firepower was one of the most successful modern-day examples of a band making music that holds up to their past. You know? And by the way, and I'll put Accept in that same category, too, you know, those records with Tornillo are amazing. He's, uh, you know, not only is Udo an incredibly hard guy to replace, but you've got a guy like Tornillo that sounds totally different than Udo, but like he's doing something that kind of fits the vibe, even if it's different, and the band's still making great music. And, you know, again, but again, guys, except, you know, these guys are in their 50s. It's a whole difference between, you know, 
doing it in your 50s and doing it in your 70s. You know, Except couldn't have made these comeback records if they were 70 years old. But can they do it in their early 50s? Yes. But the funny thing with Except, so, which, which I find interesting, is that it's almost a little bit like the first one with Mark Turnillo is a little bit like Perpendicular with Deep Purple. It's like, wow, a whole new thing. I can't believe they made this really good album with this with this new guitarist, with Mark Turnillo. It's, it's this new singer. The guy's incredible. He looks great on stage. The dude's yeah, like 50 years him. old. He takes his shirt off. He's, he's, he's buff. You know, he's a great singer. He's a great front man. But the funny thing that I'm hearing from Except fans, which which again starts bringing in this creeping, creeping in thing where we go, we love the first one, we really like the second one, but after three and four of them, you're going, these are all sounding like, like Andy Sneak calls it, desktop metal. Yeah, We're starting, I and, and the, it's that. the same problem with Saxon. Too many records, too many perfect, excellent records over and over again. Eventually, you go, uh, you know, it was it was really special the first time, but it's getting less special every time. Agree. That's where they fall into that comfort zone. And I think that's where you do have to progress and make the next record different from the last one. Again, you could say, you could argue these are all great records. And it really comes down to, you know, when you talk about bands like Accept, Saxon, a lot of these, what you call these newer like, power metal bands. You hear, you know, Primal Fear, all these, you, you can name a hundred of these bands. You can listen to the record and go, wow, this is great stuff. But there's nothing original or unique about it. They got their formula down, and they're That's sticking to that formula, which yeah. to the lot of the old, old school fans, they love that. They want The purists want that. But are they progressing? Are they making anything different? And in this day and age, they probably go, why bother? What's the point to progress? Radio is not going to play it. It's not going to – let's just give what the fans want. And I think yeah. that is the problem with today's metal is they're just, you know – going hey what what do our fans want let's give them just that yeah well, okay let's make a yeah. clear break bob lead us to the next band uh well i know you guys always talk about zz top that's a band that i was never uh, okay. I, i've always loved their well, early well, stuff but that, yeah, that i know is, with this one well yeah. let's go into zz top from their well, earlier one Z, zz off? top are a band that takes 10 years these days to write a record that they feel good enough about uh you know to schedule to, you know Put the grandkids aside and like get in a room and write together. So it takes them ten years to make a record, and in my opinion, none of these recent records by them hold a flame to their early records. And although there are glimpses of brilliance, for example, that song on the newest record, "I Got to Get Paid," I think is like right up there with the you know among the best ZZ Top songs of all time. So every so often they can you know, dip into the well and bring back some magic from the past and write a good song or two, as most of these bands can. Like, all these bands can usually, like, muster up a good song or two per record. But as a whole, you know, it doesn't it touch the, you know, the first album through Afterburner. The, no, doesn't even come close. I know Martin's okay. going to disagree. Of course, okay, he thinks some yeah. of the later records are the I, best ones. And... Okay. <laughs> okay, so, so what I'll say is... is do not mention the first ZZ, the second ZZ, or Afterburner in that. that I know you call them the Brown albums. I, uh, the, we, the we're third, just like an old, we're like an old married couple, you and I. The Martin. third through Eliminator, <laughs> yes, you you can say that's that's all classic, right? But you cannot include Afterburner in that. You cannot. Dude, include... I put on ZZ Top's first album the other day. I thought it was fucking amazing. It has twenty thousand okay. times more the magic than the last record. I'll tell you okay, that. So, so so with ZZ Top, I think. Absolutely, they are another example that I'll put in that Motorhead and Deep Purple camp. And and I don't like the last album very much. I Got to Get Paid is incredible, but it's the best song on a short album. I don't think Left Future is that good. Mescalero, I love. My favorite ZZ Top album of all time is Rhythmine. I don't mind XXX. I really like, uh, what's it called, Antenna a lot as well. So as soon as they rediscover, see, this is the other thing that happens with some of these bands. ZZ Top, Cheap Trick, Deep Purple, Kiss, they're all in this category. Heart is another great example of this. They're all in this category of eventually they, you know, for better or worse, they rediscovered their old sound, and they kind of went back to it. So ZZ Top went through that very electro era. Um, after, you know, you can argue Antenna is kind of the transitional one, but I love Antenna. But no, I mean, I, I really, here's another example, again, of a band where where I'll only pipe up and compare them to the Deep, 
deep purple situation because I think throw away the live side of Fandango. So Fandango is only half good and it's absolutely amazing for the half that's there. Um, but there's two or three songs on all of those. Plus there's some bad productions where as soon as I start putting them up against Mescalero and Rhythmine, which are just start to finish, absolutely entertaining, blazing, heavy, great guitar sound, great guitar work. I think Billy does his greatest solos across those albums. I love when both of their voices are getting getting nastier like that. Um, there's there's humor. They're long and yet there's no there's not really any filler. Um, so ZZ Top's a maybe not of, filler, but not great songs. Yeah. Well, okay, but Martin, ZZ Martin, Top, I know you love Rhythmine. I've gone back to Rhythmine ten different times. <laughs> because you keep raving about it. I, I couldn't sing a fucking note from that record. There were no songs. Yeah, well, songs... Where's the songs? Thing that, that it's, it's really hard to uh, to argue for or against. It's just a very weird, magical thing. Hooks, all this stuff. Um, it, it, I, it, it's hard to have an argument about what is a great song. It really is, I think. I, well, I don't know. I can name every song of Trey Gombrose, and I can't name a single song of Rhythm Bob, can you name a song of Rhythm No. Nope. Well, on, on this one. <laughs> And I've tried listening to Rhythm Me too. I, I agree, it's a good record, great production. I think it's a good comeback record. It certainly beats a lot of their their uh, a, a previous records that they had done on the modern era. But it's definitely no, you know, no fan. Yeah, and or- I like all those ZZ records. Every one of these later day records, like the Motorhead records, I buy them. I like these records. I'm just objecting to you trying to compare them to their heyday as in the '70s. That's it. Well, dude, there was I'm not a trying magic- to Rhythm Me. But I'm going to trash it if you start putting it in the same category as Trey Gombrich. Yeah, there was definitely a magic about old ZZ Top, which was so unique and so real. They really defined that Texas bluesy boogie band. They were they were the definition of, of Texas Southern rock. I mean, every song was so different. And so, I mean, you, you listen to Heard It on the X. You listen to LaGrange. You listen to Tush. You listen to, I mean, you take the whole first Tush is rate. crap. Tush is horrible. Dude, it's that a crappy is, song. That is a great. Wait, wait what song? Which one? Tush. Tush. It's just a dumb, dipshit little boogie song. It's dumb. It's, Dude, it's like an it's AC/DC simplicity type and dumbness anthem. is what makes it great. That riff, it's, it, no, it is. No. It's a simple ACDC riff type Southern oh, yeah. anthem. Yeah. It's a fucking great tune, dude. Heard it on the X that. is a masterpiece, and then and then there's masterpieces all across for different reasons, production reasons across the Degueo and Tejas, like great, great albums. But and, my point is, every album. song is completely different. Every song is memorable. And we can name them. You, you could That's say we can how name the songs. Different. You they are say, different. You're right. Totally. That, is a, that is a very important point. I mean, ZZ does get safe. The production stays safe. There's not as much variety. And, and like you say, Bob, I mean, I mean, one of the big things about the 70s is there was a lot of variety across these records. You really don't get a lot of variety across Motorhead, and you certainly Absolutely. don't across ZZ. ZZ has a very, you know, th- their sound is is really confined over the last about five records, pretty much, right? Very. But I, I still think it's all brilliant. And you know, these guys would commit suicide if you if you and Monty convinced them that they could that they could never improve, that they can never get better. It's like, it's like, it, it is a little unreasonable to think you actually don't get better at this. It is odd. I mean, I, I'm, I'm with you on a lot of this, but it's, it's really strange to think that experience stands for nothing. You actually get worse with age. It's, in I, music, I, I do, uh, again, I, I don't think it gets that. better in music. Although, Martin, I'll give you one point, and I'm not, I'm not talking about lyrics, like, you know, may, I, I am open to the fact that these old artists can write better lyrics and have more experiences. So I'm, I'm with you. I think they can improve or at least match their lyrics from the past. I'm talking about the music and the songwriting. I mean, look, I'll, give me, when ZZ Top writes an I Got to Get Paid, which is, by the way, like, you know, a cover, half of a cover. Right. Yeah. When they write a song like that, I'm cheering. Write a great song and I'll call it that. I fucking love that song. But between I Got to Get Paid and, let's say, you know, My Head's in Mississippi, which is on Recycler, I don't think I can name a single song that they wrote in between My Head's in Mississippi and I Got to Get Paid. What about as a blues guitarist? songs that don't resonate. Can can Billy improve as a blues guitarist over time? I prefer his earlier stuff, personally. Yeah, maybe. Uh, Maybe, yeah, maybe you can... I'm not, and by the way, I'm not saying that these, when I'm talking about musicians not being like painters, like, you know, I do think that they can improve lyrics. I do think they can improve as players. You know, may, I'm sure Ian Pace at his age is probably a better drummer than Ian Pace at 18. But I, what I, where it falls down for me is the songwriting. That's what it's about. They can't write the songs 
and have the attitude and the importance and the cutting edge. Not, that's the stuff that can happen. Can they improve as individual musicians or as lyricists? Yeah. Yes, I think they can. Well, I agree 100% okay, there band. If, you, if you get into lyrics. Another point you can make for ZZ Top, you can make for ACDC in particular. I mean, you, you listen to Brian Johnson's lyrics, they are completely lame. Every song is about love, sex, rock and roll. Every, every title has love or rock and roll in it. But it works for ACDC. There's something about it that works. But if you break it down to just lyrics alone, I think a lot of these bands, you know, particularly these classic bands, you can't compare the early lyrics where anything goes. And, and maybe it's the, the difference between back in the day, you didn't have to worry about, you know, this PC environment or anything else. You could basically, there were so many great sexual innuendos that uh, Bon Scott used to use, uh, uh, Robert Plant used, you know, Ian Gillen used so many brilliant, witty innuendos that you could, you could, you know, write a song about, fucking some chick in the ass and get it more radio play than any other song on the album without anyone knowing what the song's about except the hardcore fans and i think there's a brilliance about that and there's not anything in the last 20 30 years lyrically of, of any of these bands that i think captured those kind of moments but cool. it's all been done you can't there's only so many jokes it's all been done yeah, you can't there are not the end on those played out you know that, that's one of the big problems with, with ever sort of championing the newer stuff again. I mean, we, you know, we've, we've circled around it, but the idea is it's all been done by you and then everybody who copied you in the ensuing 30 years in the middle, too. So you're right. I mean, by the end of it, I mean, I, again, I don't see that problem with Deep Purple. I think, I think they're inspired, but I do see that problem with Saxon, Judas Priest, and Accept. It's like, it's like how do you do anything new? Um, you just can't. I mean, everybody He's copying you. Primal Fear Bob is copying you. I mean, everybody's copying you, right? And and doing doing what you did. But so, where do you guys stand on ACDC? ACDC is uh, I don't know. I guess they're a bit of an exception for me. I mean, I think again, I buy every single ACDC record as it comes out. There's always moments of magic. I thought the song Rock and Roll Train was fantastic. There were a couple of. I thought the last record was, you know, not one of their better ones. But yet there were two to three songs on that record, including Play Ball and like whatever the singles were. Was it called Playball? Yeah, um, that's the only good song on it, I thought. It yeah, great. there were two or three songs. I thought let's, I thought there were at least two songs on the last ACDC record, one of which is Playball, that to me captured the magic of what I love about ACDC. So, again, you could take every ACDC record of the last 20 years, put together an amazing best of that would be as good as anything they've ever done, you know, but, but that's just it. Like, these records have their highlights. But as a whole, they're not great. But you got to give the, you know, band like ACDC, just like Motorhead, you got to give them incredible props for, you know, just giving people what they want, not changing, not trying to be cute, just doing what they do and uh, doing it with integrity right till the end. I mean, how do you not have massive respect for ACDC or Motorhead? Yeah, the problem with ACDC. Or Saxon. But the problem with ACDC that a lot of people forget is that they essentially went into a semi-retirement after Razor's Edge. I mean, they made so few albums. It's not as bad as Van Halen, but it's but it's almost as bad, right? Um, but yeah, I mean, so few records because it takes them that long to get inspired yeah. to write a good record. Look at the Who, so, right? The so. Who are making a new record now. When you read interviews, yeah. talk about insecurity. You read interviews with Pete Townsend, like, yeah, I'm going to make a new Who record when I have something to say, like when I've got songs I'm excited about, when I think I have material that's good enough, that's when I'll go make a record. I think I mean, he's being honest. Insecurity. I think it's yeah. huh? I think he's being honest too. He's probably yeah, saying no, and I'm yeah. dude. He's totally being honest, and I give him all the credit in the world. But again, he's being honest, but he's illustrating the points I'm making. Absolutely, that these guys, you know, they lose their ability, they become insecure, and it takes them ten years to write with you know a good record where they used to peel one out in six months. Well, that is true. And Martin, I I, I got to ask you because I know you do a lot of interviews of these artists, uh, these classic rock bands, and I've talked to many of them, and you know, and, and friends of mine and stuff like that that have been in for in bands for years, and there is that insecurity factor, especially of these bands that were big in the 80s and then go, going through the 90s and into 2000, they're kind of almost embarrassed to, to, to write songs like they used to back then because they see how, you know, the times have changed with alternative and grunge and different kinds of mo movements. So lyrically and musically, they feel very insecure that they're able to write something that will still be relevant. And they're confused. They don't know, should we? Should I go back to my same formula? Should I change? And most bands that try to change, as you know, a lot of these 80s rock and metal bands, 
they're unsuccessful at doing it. So there is this, there's got to be a huge amount of insecurity, especially when it comes to the, the changing of the, of the guard, so to speak, when it comes to the musical atmosphere, you know, particularly of the, de- the decades between the 80s and the 90s. I found that huge, where a lot of bands got so you insecure know, and they tried you're, fitting you're in. Get point. This is actually like even a deeper point on that. Like forget insecurity. I, I think with some bands, I have a theory about certain people like Blue Oyster Cult, maybe even a little bit like Rush now. I almost think that, that as time goes on, forget insecurity. It's more like they're embarrassed to be a rock star. They're embarrassed to write songs. They think they think the rock and roll song idiom is is for young people. They're they're buying this argument in themselves in their head, and they're they're literally saying it's kind of embarrassing to even think that I would write a rock song at this age. You know, it's it's I'm I'm not sure exactly what I'm getting at, but it but it's almost like. This was something I did in my 20s, and it just seems trivial to me with all that's going on in the world or all the living I've lived and my three wives and, uh, you know, dealing with cancer that I would even consider writing a rock song. I I think there's a little bit of that that goes on in Blue Oyster Cult. They know they, they wrote for their whole career at such a high standard, and eventually they say, plus... Plus, they realize they're they're modest enough to realize that no one cares what they do out there in the world. They're just like in in this vacuum, like no one's going to pay any attention. But I think I think Buck especially, Eric maybe less so, but Buck strikes me as the kind of guy, and and I kind of got this, you know, the the times I've you know this has sort of come up. It's it's a little bit like this is silly writing rock songs. I'm not going to write any rock songs. I don't want to make a record. Your... Well, there hasn't been a Blue Oyster Cult record since what, which, uh, Curse of the Hidden Earth? Yeah, Curse of the Yeah, I mean, this is an band that tours that are, you know, of, of continuing concern, and yet they can't put a record out. Why is that? It's not that they can't get a record deal, but why, you know, did they not, are they not writing material that they think is good enough? Are they not inspired? Do they think people I think won't care? True. I mean, forget about the fact that they think people might not care or... You know, maybe they think the uh, model of the record industry is broken. That doesn't stop you from creating. You know, people who create just create in a vacuum, regardless of whether they could get a deal or not. Like, they're going to want to write songs and create. And this band's not creating. Why is that? Yeah, I just think there are certain people that find it just silly to be writing rock songs in their 60s. Well, I I know we're going to kind of have to end this uh, coming up, but... I think when it comes to, if you look at a lot of these bands, where it really could affect them is, is, is the thrash bands. And you take Metallica, for example. I mean, a lot of the, you know, you take the big four bands and even, you know, yeah, Testament, Exodus, all these other bands, Death Angel. I think they're still putting out records that are killer today that still have the same formula. But as you say, they change lyrically and attitude wise. I mean, there's always going to be purists well, that are going to say to Metallica or Slayer, oh man, they sound like the family band live. But you can't picture no, but James Hetfield or Tom Mariah, you know, Tom Mariah talking about necrophiliaism at 58 years old or however old he is, you know, it's going to come off corny. You're making a good point though, Bob. Like, we haven't talked about the thrash genre, but I think the thrash genre has proved really resilient. Because you have bands like Overkill in Creator, Testament, Metallica, Slayer, a handful of these bands, quite a few, yep. still making really great music. I mean, Testament are a perfect example of a band that's writing, you know, making records arguably as good as some of their classics. I mean, it does seem like these thrash bands can kind of recapture the spirit and, and you know, do what the fans are going to want to do from them in a high quality way. But again, all these bands that I just named, you know, these are guys in like their late 40s, early 50s. You know, I mean, it's, I guess it's still possible to do it at that age. But when you're talking about, you know, 70 year olds like Deep Purple, ain't going to happen. Yeah, Done. but still, I, I think you, you have to kind of walk that fine line. Is you, you have to know how to mature. And I don't think it really will change musically. You can still be just as aggressive musically, still write killer songs, still have that integrity and attitude. But, you know, what you say maybe lyrically or how you present yourself in interviews, you know, you're not going to see interviews of, uh, you know, Dave Mustaine or James Hetfield saying, yeah, kill the poser, fuck it, that's, you know, yeah, yeah, you yeah. know, I mean, you have to kind of mature. And I think there's a way where musically you could still have that same aggressive attitude as you had in the early 80s, whether you're a thrash band or whether you're a deep purple, yet, you know, still mature lyrically and, you know, and, and just in the way you present yourself. Do you agree I think two or not things agree? going for thrash, two things going for thrash that have allowed those bands to stay really healthy is A, 
it was progressive, hard to play, challenging music anyway. So there's always going to be a lot of you know different Japanese origami ways to uh, to play with that formula, rather than if you're ACDC or Motorhead or the Ramones or whatever. Uh, and the other great thing I think is that lyrically all of that stuff was pretty pretty uh, adult in the room the, the whole time. Like all the political stuff and the socio sociological stuff and the stuff about suicide and nuclear war and, and all that. And just and, and who doesn't like a song about rocking out? You know, but they, they do the, even that with humor. So there was always sort of this mature feeling lyrically going on. So they didn't have to grow as far as, as a complete kitty band uh, had to grow. So I, I think, and, and I agree. I mean, my favorite band of, of that whole genre for the last Last probably five ten years that I play over and over again is Overkill. I love Overkill, and I, I, I think Blitz is just this perfect example of a guy that that just you know he's like Ian Gillen and Roger Glover. I think he's basically a guy that says, you know what, I'm just going to write for for my age, whatever that age is, and I'm, I'm never going to try to look like a young kid. I'm just going to literally just keep growing with my audience, and I think that's why Overkill is so healthy. Yeah, but Blitz sounds incredible, too. I mean, that guy's voice is just yeah. spot on. He hasn't lost anything. And by the way, the absolute sweetest, nicest guy you could ever meet on this oh, plane yeah. is Bobby Blitz. The guy is just pure gold. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for listening to the Shockwave Skull Sessions podcast. You can subscribe and listen to all episodes of the Shockwave Skull Sessions podcast on iTunes, SoundCloud, iHeartRadio, TuneIn, Spreaker, Google Play, and more. Be on the lookout real soon for our new website, at www.shockwaveskullsessions.com. Go to our social media pages on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and YouTube for up-to-date news on the Shockwave Skull Sessions podcast. Email all questions, comments, and suggestions to shockwaveskullsessions at gmail.com.